Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of Your Football Opinion. I am your host, Theo Ash, and in today's episode, I've got some fantasy football takes. I'm just going to be rattling them off one after the other for about an hour. But before we get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Brandon Ayuk situation. I'm excited to talk about fantasy here on the last day before the NFL preseason starts. From every podcast from here on out, I'll have games to talk about, and that's probably what I'll be talking about. But for at least one episode, I got to talk some fantasy football. I've branded myself as a bit of a fantasy football hater on Twitter, I'd say. If I see an abysmal take, I will quote tweet it and say something like fantasy football in bio, because usually there is like the worst takes that you see on social media usually come from someone who views the sport like the stock market and the numbers that we watchers have context for, they're just looking at blindly and making a, making conclusions that we know aren't true because they're not even looking for any nuance. It's just like someone is young and had yards. They will be the greatest player ever. I don't know. But fantasy doesn't have to be bad. What happens in the game is rooted in what happens on the field. So the best way to make good fantasy takes, I think, is to understand really the landscape of the league. So they go hand in hand, real football and fantasy football, and you can talk about one without being dumb about the other. So that's what I intend to do. This is a very nostalgic exercise for me because really my first interactions with football at like a deep level I'd say have to do with fantasy. I mean, it's just making lists like I'm doing now, but you know, before I was Theo Ash NFL and before I was making film breakdowns and knew the difference between even inside and outside zone, I knew fantasy football, right? And I would get into it. I'd have a night where I'd have my, I wouldn't even have my laptop at this point. I'd be like down at the family desktop computer with just a ton of stats in the middle of the night trying to prepare for my draft. And this is what tonight felt like for me, which is always a good night. So what I'm going to do here, well, first let's talk about Brandon Ayuk and that whole situation. I'm calling it a situation because I don't know what's going on. If here's all I know, if he goes to the Steelers, he'll be great in their scheme. And that move would move me. Okay, he's the type of player that if he goes to the Patriots, he'll fit in that scheme. And that move would move me. He's the type of player where he could go to the Browns. And they would probably move into a tier above where I have them now, ranked. Like, Brandon Ayuk getting moved would be kind of a league-altering thing, I think. Because Brandon Ayuk, I saw the stat from Field Vision Sports. Brandon Ayuk was second in EPA generated versus man coverage last season. And another thing that was detailed in this tweet that is important is that Debo Samuel was ranked 137th in EPA generated versus man coverage, according to them. So Brandon Ayuk is very important to the 49ers as their downfield separator. And what a separator he is. I think that he is the most flexible, elastic route runner that we've got in the league right now. At the top of his routes, I mean, people know that he's probably going to break inside. But he's so good at setting you up with that outside fake that corners can't do anything. They have to respect it. And then he just crosses their face, changes directions in an instant, and springs out of his break, flying across the middle of the field, ready to catch the ball, does catch the ball. He uses that same skill set to turn up field or contort himself and break a tackle. He's got that famous hurdle. He's a bigger, he's, he's not a small receiver, so he can kind of run through people really excels at all areas, especially tracking the ball over his shoulder. He had a play that I think you all remember, the one that bounced off Kendall Vildor's face mask in the NFC Championship game. There was nothing accidental about that or lucky. You can see Brandon Ayuk tracking it over his right, left shoulder? I can't remember what shoulder. Over one shoulder. He's tracking it, tracking it, tracking it, seeing that it's an overthrow, jumping for it anyway. His jump 
doesn't make contact with the ball, but it does kind of screen Vildor's vision and make the tough cut, the catch tough for him. So Vildor doesn't track it. It bounces off of his face mask. Ayuk, after jumping, lands and keeps running. He has not taken his eye off the ball. He has seen it bounce off the face mask. He's watching it pop up in the air off the deflection. You can see his head moving up and then moving back down as he looks it down into his hands as he makes the dri- diving catch. And it's the staying on his feet after jumping that really blows my mind. Like staying on your feet, switching the shoulder you're looking over, tracking it off a deflection. And like I said, there's nothing accidental about it. There's nothing lucky. It's not like he was just on the ground and the ball fell into his lap. He had to go keep running and get that thing. Just incredible. And I think given the stakes, given the magnitude of that of that moment and how it swung the game, I think it's one of the top five catches that I've ever seen in my life. And on top of all the natural receiving talent that he has, he's also one of, if not the best blockers amongst wide receivers in the league. And kind of the reason that that outside zone scheme works so well in San Francisco, because he's able to seal guys off and McCaffrey gets the edge or he's able to dig out nickelbacks or safeties from his outside receiver position. So if Arthur Smith were to get him, there'd probably be a little bit too much blocking, but Arthur Smith, his offenses have a kind of always run through one wide receiver, AJ Brown or Drake London. If Ayuk was that guy, like he would excel. If he goes to the Patriots and it's more of a West Coast type system, he would excel, right? It, it doesn't matter. He can do whatever you need him to do. So even the Patriots that were abysmal last year could turn into, I think, a playoff contender because I like their defense. I like their quarterback room. I think they've got two good options. And if they added a receiver like May, like they could contend for the playoffs next year or this year. It's coming up fast. And if the 49ers lost him, I don't think rolling with Ricky Pearsall would be the same. I'm sorry. Like he was a fine prospect, but he cannot be the type of blocker that Ayuk was because of his size, I think. And he's just not as unique of an athlete. If the 49ers are to lose Ayuk, I think it casts serious doubt on their status in the NFC at at the top of it. If they're not already uh, not at the top of it. If you listen to the last episode, you know what I'm talking about. And I think it would really, it it could threaten their position even within the division if they lost Ayuk. Because I like the Seahawks, I like the Rams, I like the Cardinals even. I think they they still have a lot of star power if Ayuk gets moved, especially if they can bring in another player. I know the Steelers don't seem like they want to give a player up in return, but that's what the 49ers need. So maybe a three-team deal? is being negotiated. That's one rumor that I saw tonight. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like they offered him 26 million per year according to the Athletic. That is a low ball. The Patriots offered him 28 and a half million per year. That's a good better offer, but it sounds like he doesn't want to play there. Uh, but yeah, if if they lost him, I do think the Seahawks and the Rams would really start Licking their chops, like oh, we could actually go get these guys now. Could they? I don't know, but I think it would. I think it would make it a conversation. So, my suspicion has always been this ends with them not trading him and maybe a holdout, which doesn't really give you a good conclusion. But that's where I think this might be headed because I think there's just too many complicated factors in this trade to make everybody happy. Ayuk, the team that trades for Ayuk, and the 49ers think all those things might be too at odds for anything to work out, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see. And if something happens by the time this episode releases, cause I'm talking about it before it comes out, just know that whatever team ends up with Ayuk is the winner in my eyes. And it's not just cause he went to Arizona state. So now let's talk some fantasy. I want to start with maybe the big ticket position running back. I feel like that's kind of your main fantasy football character every year. I've got a top 10 list. I've got two sleepers for each position. And I've got one guy that I think is being maybe overdrafted for each position. And we'll go through quarterback, tight end, running back, wide receiver. I don't have any kicker or defense rankings for you tonight. 
because it's late already. But let's let's do this running back thing. At number one, I've got Christian McCaffrey. Okay, I'm not too much of a hot take artist. Don't get cute with the first overall pick. Just take McCaffrey. He sc- he got to San Francisco and scored a touchdown in 17 straight games. That streak got broken, but I think he could very easily just start a new streak. He is the perfect scheme fit. He's got just about as much or more receiving upside as anybody else while being the probable yards leader on the ground. Okay, this is just the best offense. We know they're going to be in the red zone all the time. We know McCaffrey is going to score the majority of their touchdowns. The number two running back is always like Brees Hall. And he's really talented. He's going to be high on this list. But if he's a trendy pick to go above CMC, I can't get down with it because he's got some serious ground to make up because the Jets offense is not nearly as good as what the 49ers are bringing to the table. And who else would be the first overall pick? C.D. Lamb. Like the Cowboys offense is good. It's probably not as good as what the 49ers offense is. So C.D. Lamb would have to make up ground. And I just don't know if you can make up that much ground when Christian McCaffrey is as good as he is. B. John Robinson's number two in a lot of places. Like the Falcons offense is not going to be as good as the 49ers. So like where is B. John making up ground on CMC? I, I just don't know. So CMC number one. Don't overthink it. I think you can overthink number two, and perhaps I am overthinking number two. My second ranked fantasy running back, it's not Brees Hall. It's not B. John Robinson. It's it's A. Chain. It's A. Chain. Because I have a lot of faith in Mike McDaniel to put up numbers. It reminds me a little bit of when me and my friends play a NCAA dynasty and there's maybe three of us in there and you look at the top of every single leaderboard and for some reason you're always seeing UConn, Colorado State, and Kennesaw State leading the Heisman race, leading every statistic and everything because we're users and the rest are CPUs. That's kind of what the 49ers and Dolphins feel like. These coaches, at the end of the day, are going to put up numbers. It doesn't matter who the player is. The the seventh round pick, the last overall pick in the draft, is going to be an MVP candidate. Cooper Cup is going to be the greatest wide receiver of all time. Like, you think A-Chain at number two is crazy? Guess who the second ranked running back was in standard and half PPR last year? It was Raheem Mostert. Like my, my, Tua, I I don't, like I said this last episode, I don't think Tua is like crazy good. He's still going to lead the league in passing yards and EPA and everything. These players just lead stuff. And if you want to make a really ideal fantasy team, my advice would be build a Shanahan tree all-star group. Don't even look at the other systems. If you can just find LaFleur, McDaniel, Shanahan, and McVay, and make an all-star team of their players, you're probably going to win your league. A-Chain might be the next... He might be the next Chris Johnson. He might be the next Jamal Charles. Like, it really would not be a big deal for McDaniel to make him the rushing yards leader. He already averaged 7.8 yards per carry last year. He just needs to be a little bit healthier. He doesn't even need that many carries probably to do it. So... Yeah, life is short. You're playing to win. I think A-Chain is a good bet. And again, throughout your draft and throughout this episode, I'm going to say Shanahan Tree players, very good bet. And number three, it's a little bit more normal. I got Brees Hall. He had every excuse to be bad last year, to be disappointing. He had the worst quarterback situation in the league. Maybe the worst offensive line situation in the league. His coordinator was Matt uh, was Nathaniel Hackett. Plenty of reason to just be making excuses for his 15th ranked finish last year. But that's not what happened at all. He was second in PPR. And I think that just kind of means he's situation proof, honestly. The the last two seasons, the success that he's had. Now, I'm just drooling at the thought of what he could do in an offense that I think has a chance to be legitimately good. Because 
wide receivers, not wide receivers, quarterbacks who get to age 40 are usually good to, at age 40. Drew Brees was good at age 40. Tom Brady was good at age 40. Warren Moon was good at age 40. Like if you get there, you're probably going to be all right. And Rodgers has gotten there with all the lessons he's learned over his time as an NFL quarterback, an infinite knowledge of the game. I just think it's very easy for players that old to kind of pick things apart as long as their athleticism is still there a little bit. And it makes me optimistic that Rodgers tore his Achilles not on the foot that he draws his power from when he throws. It's the foot that he steps forward with. So in a situation where he's where Rodgers has Hall himself, Wilson, an offensive line that added Tyron Smith, Morgan Moses, John Simpson, Olu Fashanu, I think this will be so, so, so much smoother than it has been in years past. Like it, it really doesn't take much. The gulf between Zach Wilson and the next worst quarterback is like the gulf between Patrick Mahomes and like, and like Kenny Pickett. <laughs> That's not quite true. But if, yeah, if Hall can be productive last year, I don't see why he couldn't be a potential league winner this year. At number four, I've got Jonathan Taylor. I think he, I was pleasantly surprised at his results last year, scored plenty of touchdowns, put up yards, was efficient in terms of DVOA. Like he was coming off a holdout. He was banged up. Get plenty of reason for him to maybe, you maybe have to make excuses for him going into this year, but he actually produced pretty well. And his last game of the season was an absolute masterclass versus Houston. So I think he's going to be ready to go next year. There's no drama this time around. Seems like he's pretty healthy. Offensive line in Indianapolis is good. They've got Anthony Richardson to take some of the pressure off of him uh, in the gaps. Maybe he steals some of his touchdowns, which is maybe more of a bigger deal in fantasy. But still, I think that Taylor could have a bit of a vintage season next year in an offense that will love to run the football, I think. In an offense that will move up and down the field. And Taylor's running back two behind him is like Trey Sermon, who doesn't scare me that much in terms of cutting into his carries at all. So I like Jonathan Taylor a lot. At number five, I've got Derrick Henry, and I will be the guy that pounds the table for him when everybody else is telling you to fade him, like they've been telling you to fade him for years. Oh, the numbers, the cut off the cliff. Derrick Henry is going to fall off. He, I'm here to tell you he will never fall off, ever. He's too, he's too big, too strong, too fast to fall off. If he was going to fall off because of tread on his tires, it would have happened the first time he had in a three, 370 carry season. Every running back falls off after getting that many touches. Not Derrick Henry. In fact, he does it again. He has a second 370 touch season and still doesn't fall off the year after that. And I think his numbers last year just get more and more impressive the more you dig into them. Like he was averaging two feet before contact behind the Titans offensive line last year. The Titans were still top five in yards after contact because of Derrick Henry. He's going to the Ravens who ranked top five in yards before contact last year. And they have Lamar Jackson (laughs) and their offense is just going to be so much better than the, than the Titans are. And this is an offense that liked to lean on its running backs inside the five yard line last year to the point where people couldn't understand why Lamar was winning MVP It's because, like, oh, he only has 23 touchdowns. It's because Gus Edwards vultured all of them away. And I think Henry, like, could he score 15 touchdowns in this offense next year and have 1,000 yards? Like, I think it could easily happen. Could he score more touchdowns than that? I think it could could happen. He's got so much upside. I think about him compared to B. John Robinson. Because right now, there's a big gap between where those two are ranked. But last year... Henry was slightly above Robinson. And what excuse does Robinson have for that? Like his situation was rough with Arthur Smith, but I don't know if it was as rough as what Derrick Henry was dealing with. And I agree that Bijan's situation is better this year. He's going to skyrocket up the carries leaderboard, which is going to be good because of all the talent that he has. But like Henry's that dude as well. 
and he's entering a better situation. The only thing people have to fade Henry is a guess. And it's the same guess that's been wrong for three years in a row now, which is, oh, he's hit this threshold. He's going to slow down now. I just don't know about that. I'll believe it when I see it. I've been calling him for a while the Tom Brady of running backs because he's so far past that threshold. And what I remember with the end of Tom Brady's career is he had a inefficient final season in, in New England. And then he left at his ripe age and hit free agency. And he signed with a contender whose situation was way better. And then he balled out at an age no one thought he could do it at after a season that was considered, you know, the beginning of the end for him. So if Derrick Henry is really the Tom Brady of running backs, like it could be the beginning of the the kind of similar story where he was obviously balling on the Titans, but he might have a few years on the Ravens here where like he becomes known as a Raven as well because of uh, the success I believe they're capable of having together and potentially winning a Super Bowl together. So I I still really like Derrick Henry. I like B. John Robinson a lot as well. I just don't quite have him in a a tier alone like a lot of people do. He was a bit disappointing last year. And he was in the he was totally healthy. And I get that Arthur Smith didn't use him a whole lot, but they're still kind of hyping up Algier, that coaching staff is. So he could still vulture touchdowns away. I don't know. I'm not 100 percent sold on the Falcons, especially post Rondale Moore injury. Like if Drake London, if anything were to happen to Drake London the wide receiver room would be a complete disaster. And I think they could struggle moving the ball again, good player. They're bringing in Raheem Morris. They're bringing in Zach Robinson from LA. I think that will help them. Robinson will get more carries. He, I think he can finish his running back six. Obviously that's why I'm putting him here, but we have to acknowledge that that in and of itself is a really big gap from where a really big jump from where he was at last year. Next I've got, I'm debating still, Gibbs or Barkley. I'll make both cases. I'm I'm leaning Barkley. I'm leaning old running backs, which is probably horrific advice. I'm so sorry, everybody. I'm this is probably the worst segment in the history of fantasy football podcasting because I'm recommending the old running backs to everybody. But I'm kind of leaning Barkley because there's this one stat that kind of sticks in my mind, which is that. Last season, DeAndre Swift had more yards before contact than any other running back last year, but was dead last in yards after contact, which made me think, okay, the situation is creating kind of a lot of production for these backs. And then you look at Saquon Barkley in New York, and it was kind of the opposite story. He was near the bottom or at the bottom in yards before contact because the offensive line was so bad, but he actually did pretty well for himself in terms of yards after and generating explosive runs. He still had that juice to him. So now you're kind of combining the after-contact stuff from Barkley and the explosiveness from Barkley to a situation where there will be more wide-open running lanes. And I do think that the, the situation is ripe for a big season for Barkley. But deep down, there is a little bit of doubt because of how inefficient Barkley was these last few years. And he is older than Gibbs and... I don't know. The Eagles don't quite have the play calling that the Lions do, which could end up mattering. I read that article on Hertz and the, his relationship with Sirianni. It sounded pretty ugly. And now that Jason Kelsey is gone, that's an all pro lineman miss, missing. And it's someone who made a lot of their calls pre-snap. I could see the synergy being very off with the Eagles next year still. And them forced to make a tough decision regarding Sirianni. If, if they can't get, the ship right fast. And I, they got to earn my trust back because they were really abysmal at the end of last season. Whereas the lions have been steady, 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 but Gibbs obviously has Montgomery to contend with, which is no joke. So what do you rank them? I, I might go, I'll say Gibbs first, Barkley second, just keeping with my Shanahan tree. It, not that not that Ben Johnson is even Shanahan tree or anything like that, but he's he's one of those ones as a play caller. So I'll I'll go Gibbs Barkley, but it's close. 
And then I like Josh Jacobs at number nine. He is a year removed from his epic season and was actually pretty bad last year, if you look at the numbers. But the Raiders were pretty bad last year, right? That offense was ugly. You get a big boost running behind the Green Bay offensive line now in a more dangerous offense overall, more threats to score, more creases to run downhill. And Jacob still has some burst. Like he scored a 62 yard touchdown against the Chiefs, where you can see it. Like he might even have a little bit more home run ability than Aaron Jones even did last year. Now, will he be as good as Jones? I don't know. Jones never got tackled behind the line of scrimmage, one of the best ever at it. He is mystery efficiency. After the season Jacobs had, I don't know, but at the same time, like Aaron Jones was very banged up always with the Packers. So if Jacobs can be a bit more consistent in that regard, like he could have the biggest Green Bay fantasy running back season yet because of his upside, because of his home run ability and because of his catching ability. Like he's a plenty good receiver out of the backfield. So he's got some PPR bonus points as well there. And then at number 10, I've got Kyron Williams. This is a little bit lower than other people have him. He's in a good situation, but there are some things that concern me with him, specifically his foot. He has broken it in OTAs in 2022. He has gotten a high ankle sprain the debut of his rookie season. He hurt his ankle last year and it caused him to miss some time. And he was rehabbing his foot again this off season. So they're starting to pile up and the Rams drafted a running back on day two, Blake Corum. He was a workhorse at Michigan and a very similar player to Kyron Williams. He fits this scheme very well. He is not someone who's going to bounce it east and west at all. He is going to be patient, wait for the blocks to develop, hit the hole, be physical north and south. And he's got a little bit more home run speed. I mean, it's not saying much. He's got a little bit more home run speed than Kyron Williams. He's definitely more formidable of a threat to cut into Williams' workload than Cam Akers was last year. And I think there was a point where Williams got every, like 20, 20 carries every game in October. I don't think that that's happening again for him. So I've got him at 10. I don't know if he'll quite repeat his performance last year. There are some risks with him, I think. But still, you can't deny he was the number one leader in yards per game last year. So that, that means something. That means something. And he's with Shanahan, of course. So the, that's my top 10. CMC, A-Chain, Hall, Taylor, Henry, Robinson, Gibbs, Barkley, Jacobs, Williams. Some sleepers that I like, Gus Edwards. They really let Harbaugh get Gus Edwards. It's just like what happened last year. Harbaugh and Gus Edwards. It was just the other Harbaugh. And Gus Edwards scored a bunch of touchdowns. And I kind of think he's going to find his way to get into the end zone a lot on the West Coast as well and exceed his running back 37 value. Because let's, like they've got a good enough quarterback in LA that their offense should be like a baseline level of good, that they're kind of in the red zone somewhat often. Like it's not going to be a, a Patriot situation where they score like 16 times all year, right? So they're going to be moving the ball at at least like a reasonable clip, like slightly below average maybe. I don't think it's going to be a total disaster. They're going to be leaning on him a lot because that's Harbaugh's whole identity. And he, Gus Edwards just scores a bunch of touchdowns. That's basically it. And I think he's going to continue to do so. Another sleeper that I like late in the draft, Rico Doddle. And I say this only because I traded for him in the 32-man fantasy league that I'm in, which is a very crazy experience because it is so, so thin all the time. I traded Josh Palmer for Doddle and behind Tony Pollard, he actually did all right for me in that league. He paid off my faith in him. And so now he's buried in the running back rankings, even though the running back room in Dallas is terrible. They're just waiting for somebody to come out and grab it. And you know, Doddle wasn't so bad last year. And, for cheap, to be a potential lead back on a good offense, I like the flyer. He rewarded my faith last year. This year he has even higher upside. So deep in the draft, I do like Doddle. There is a pick that I think is overhyped. 
Isaiah Pacheco. I looked at the ESPN panel of experts. Almost all of them had Pacheco above Derrick Henry. And they had Pacheco above Devin A. Chain. They had him at like number nine or number eight. And it's just such an unsexy pick to me. Like, you're in this for the upside. You're not in this to finish fifth. You're in this to win the league. And I don't think picking Pacheco in the second round really helps you do that. It might help you be fine. Like, I totally trust him to have 950 yards and and seven touchdowns. I trust him to be running back 14 or 15. But, like, draft him there. Like, why are you ignoring these big, big swings for Pacheco. Like, are you really that worried about Henry's age? Are you really that worried about a chain's injury history? Like scared money don't make money. And Pacheco to me is kind of scared money. Like he's, I don't dislike him at all, but just a cowardly pick kind of in my mind. Let's move on to wide receivers. And number one, I've got C.D. Lamb. Hopefully they get a contract done. I don't know what Jerry Jones is waiting for. I don't know what year he thinks it is. Maybe he thinks it's 1940s and he's helping his, his, his grandma make hard tack to send to the Civil War sh- soldiers and he's got to be frugal. That, that must be the reality that he's living in because he's been so good drafting recently. Like the Cowboys legitimately cook in the draft and they've gotten all these stars And apparently they're expecting these stars to just play out their rookie contract and leave. Like, okay, you drafted C.D. Lamb, you turned into the best receiver in football, basically. Yeah, you're going to have to pay him like the best receiver in football, buddy. That's kind of how it works. And yet we've gotten to the point where C.D. Lamb is changing his banner to him and Hollywood Brown, fueling speculations that he might go to the Chiefs. My reading on that is just that He didn't want a picture of him as a cowboy anymore. So then he changed it to him as a Sooner. I don't think him and Hollywood Brown have quite the pull to send CD to the Chiefs. I I don't think that that will happen. Although they may be friends and change their social media banners. But at any rate, Jerry Jones, what are you doing? Get CD Lamb a contract, get Dak a contract, get Micah Parsons a contract, and then continue to draft well. You'll, you'll, You'll have success. I promise if you do that, if you let all these guys walk, you won't. But that's neither here nor there. And I do think eventually CD will get a deal done. And he's basically walking into the greatest fantasy situation a wide receiver could ever ask for. The offense runs completely through him, and it's a great offense with an MVP candidate quarterback. And yeah, that's basically all you need. The other teams in this division all have question marks at corner, I'd say. But he's going to eat. He's going to eat. He was the number one receiver last year. He's going to be again this year, I think. Number two, Tyree Kill. Also pretty self-explanatory. He's going to eat in the McDaniel system. At number three, I've got Jamar Chase. And my logic here is basically you just can't keep a good man down for too long. And Jamar Chase is really good. And the fantasy results have been a bit underwhelming these past few years. But I chalk it up to injury to himself and injury to his quarterback, Joe Burrow, of course. And that makes it kind of hard to put up elite numbers. But If those two are healthy for for a full season, I think Chase is going to pop right back up. So I've got him at number three over Justin Jefferson. That's a bit of a tough call. I hate ranking Jefferson lower than one on any list that I fill out because that guy is just inevitable. But Chase Hill and CD are damn good as well, and they don't have Sam Darnold projected to throw to them. They have surpassed Jefferson's fantasy production in the past. I do think it can happen again, but I'm, I'm not ranking Jefferson any lower than fourth. At five, I've got Amon Ross St. Brown. The offense should still flow through him. Josh Reynolds is gone. They're placing a lot on Jamison Williams' shoulder to stretch the field. But while he's getting that figured out, it's still going to be peppering these digs, these hitches, these end arounds, however they want to get Amon Ross St. Brown the ball. Just PPR monster. And these slot receivers have just kind of been baller in fantasy recently. Amon Ra, Nakua, he's my number six guy. I have them above A.J. Brown just because A.J. Brown doesn't play that type of role. And I think that that boundary field stretcher is just as valuable. 
but for fantasy purposes, it doesn't lend itself so much to like getting 150 catches. It, it feels like. So that's why I've got Nakua slightly above AJ Brown. Again, there's a little bit of Eagles weirdness that I feel it's not crippling. Like AJ Brown is still on the list, of course, but I'm just a little bit like you, you got to show me something before I invest too, too much in like Brown and Smith and Barkley, but they're still very good. At number eight, I have Jalen Waddle. He is way underranked. He is behind names like Chris Olave, Devontae Adams. I just, Drake London, I, I just don't get it. I feel the same way about Waddle as I felt about AJ Brown a couple years back when he was on the Titans. And if you followed me on TikTok a few years ago, you may remember videos of me putting AJ Brown in conversations that he probably didn't quite belong in at the time or people didn't think he belonged in because he was barely cracking a thousand yards when he was on the Titans. But the advanced metrics loved him. And so then I loved him. And then I checked out his film and he's just breaking every tackle. He's making every contested catch. Guys can't press him at the line of scrimmage. He's just living in the shadow of Derrick Henry a little bit. And it's like on a per target basis, it's clear that all he needs is more targets to become a superstar in the league. So I started ranking him crazy high before he had really broken out in Philadelphia. And that's how I feel about Waddle right now. Like he, his raw numbers don't seem to be crazy. He's not held in like the highest of high regards. He's living in the shadow of Tyree Kill, but this dude is a top 10 receiver. He is a top 10 receiver to me. The only guy who stretches the field like Waddle is Hill on his own team. But Waddle is built. He can make contested catches, tough catches over the middle. He is a good route runner. He's just complete. Compl and he offers something that hardly anybody else does. And over the last two years, he's top 10 in explosive play rate. He's top 10 in EP receiving EPA. He's top 10 in yards per route run. Like everything is telling me top 10 receiver here. And 2023 wasn't great for him, but he was on the injury report every week. He missed a handful of games. Back in 2022, he was a top 10 fantasy receiver. And I see no reason why he can't bounce back because again, McDaniel is going to put up video game numbers. And if Hill were to go down for whatever reason, Waddle would instantly become like the most valuable asset in fantasy football. And even if with Hill there, there is more than enough room in this passing offense to support two top 10 fantasy wide receivers. In fact, if they're both he healthy, I totally expect it to happen. Again, who is at the leaderboards every, at the end of every year? It's 49ers and it's Dolphins. If these guys are healthy, these guys, like Waddle is going to be in the top 10, everything. If he's healthy, that's, that's all it depends on, which is a kind of a big if with him but I'm still betting on it. Him at number eight. You can go with Devontae Adams if you want. You can go with Garrett Wilson if you want. I'm taking Waddle. I think people kind of, you can go with Drake London. I, th I think people kind of overrate target share sometimes. That's one takeaway I had doing research for this. Like Devontae Adams had a massive target share last year. Olave had a massive target share last year. They had the targets you were looking for, but the offenses weren't that good. So they were disappointing despite the fact that they had these massive workloads. And this year I see the same thing with a lot of them. I'd rather have Waddle whose workload may not be quite as big, but he's going to be so much more reliable on each and every target. So that's why I've got him at number eight over some big names. At number nine, I really struggled with this, but I kind of like... Debo Samuel, especially with Ayuk up in the air right at this very moment. If he is gone, it would also give Debo an insane boost, boost, probably to the top of the league in a bunch of metrics. If he was the wide receiver one, kind of alone, not alone because they have Jawan Jennings and Pierce Saul, but you know what I mean. And he actually did a lot better than I thought last season in fantasy. He only had 800 receiving yards, but they did hand the ball off to him a bunch and he scored five touchdowns on the ground and ended up being a top 10 fantasy receiver last year. In half PPR, 
he was at 12, okay. In standard, he was at seven. In PBR, he was at 15. Okay, so maybe nine's a little bit rich depending on the league that you're in. But again, the rushing thing just goes to show. If he is on the 49ers, there will be some way to make him cracked. <laughs> five rec- five rushing touchdowns, sure, whatever. It'll happen. So like, bet on him, bet on Cup, bet on John Tavion Wicks and Jaden Reed, two of my sleepers. And bet on Nico Collins, maybe. He kind of counts. He kind of counts. Slowick did come from San Francisco. He's my number 10 selection. He's a little bit underranked in my opinion as well. I guess people are scared of of all the different weapons that are there. That's no reason to be afraid. Too many weapons is not an issue at all. Like San Francisco has a million weapons. They all do fine. I mean, AJ Brown and Devontae Smith share a room. They, They both do fine. Like I... I really don't think that because Stefan Diggs is there, it will all of a sudden become bad for Nico Collins. It'll make the offense better, and that will make things kind of better for Collins. He was top 10 last season in fantasy points per game. I think he missed two. I think he was eighth in fantasy points per game. I just don't think the addition of Diggs means a major drop-off for him, but that's how he's getting ranked. I think he could actually have a better season. If last year was his breakout, I, I don't think that was his peak, perhaps. I mean, maybe it gets a little worse, but I like Nico Collins in the top 10 with Stroud thrown to him. My sleepers, I like Mike Williams. I think, again, on a per game basis last year, it was a very small sample size, but he did all right. And he always scores a lot of touchdowns. And like I mentioned earlier, I do think that Aaron Rodgers is going to pilot a pretty decent passing offense. And he's someone who has always kind of maximized receivers. And if you can score touchdowns, Aaron Rodgers will throw you touchdowns. So could Mike Williams kind of come out of nowhere and quietly put up a 10 touchdown season as wide receiver 47? The odds are good enough that I think it's worth taking that chance. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, I think that the Packers are, are going to be elite next season, but it's a little bit tough to decipher their offense from a fantasy perspective. But I would say Jaden, if you, if you draft Jaden Reed and Dontavion Wicks late, you're probably not going to be disappointed considering where they're being selected. Like no one can quite figure out who's going to be good. Like those two are probably, they show a lot of signs of being elite. Like Jaden Reed, really good tracker of the ball with speed can make people miss. Dontavion Wicks more of that tall, but still fluid route runner. Reed led the league, or not led the league, I'm sorry, it's late, fellas. Jaden Reed led the team in receiving yards last year quietly, I think. And Dontavion Wicks was one of the most efficient wide receivers in the league. And I saw a stat on True Media. Over the last two years, he leads the league in explosive play rate. Now, obviously, he's only been in the league for one year, so his sample size is small. But that still stood out to me. Like, Wicks is making plays. So if someone's going to break out in this Packers offense fully, I believe those two are really good shots. Someone that I think is overrated, I I kind of already mentioned these guys, but like Olave, man. The thing that sells wide receivers is people look at them and they, they see that the competition in the room and they're like, oh, he's going to get so many looks and then the looks just aren't good. Like Terry McLaurin last year was disappointing, not because he's bad, but because this quarterback situation was rough. The offensive line situation was rough. It's just tough for receivers to stand out. The Saints have Derek Carr and he's being protected by Trevor Penning and, and Fuaga, who might, maybe he's good. But I feel like we kind of already went through this last year with Olave. Like he was the only dude in the room. Everybody drafted him really high and then he just didn't do much. And I think he's a good player, but I feel like this is kind of Lucy holding the football. He's just not in an environment conducive to a ton of fantasy success. Meanwhile, like Waddle is in a situation where they get unlimited fantasy success, but Waddle is taken below Olave like substantially. 
don't quite get it. Kind of same thing with Devontae Adams on the Raiders. So those, those two, I would say, are ones to avoid. Let's move on. Crinkling my papers here. Let's, let's go to quarterback. Let's go to QB. Running through the top 10, number one, I got Josh Allen. Scored, what, 15 rushing touchdowns last year? Pretty damn good for fantasy. Throws a lot. Yeah, man. He's, uh, he's number one. Number two, st- still got Jalen Hurts. Tempting to move him down maybe a, l- a little bit. For s- but, but why, I guess? He's still got A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. I guess my only concern would be like maybe he doesn't get as many tush pushes without Kelsey, but it's probably still going to work. I mean, the dude himself is a big reason why that play works, and he can still get plenty of rushing production even if that play specifically takes a bit of a hit. Yeah, I'm going with Hurts number two. He was number two last year. This season will probably be about on par. I, I don't think they'll fall off in a major way. I guess I'm just concerned that the Eagles suffer the same problems that kill their, kill their season in the playoffs more than I think they'll co- collapse in the regular season. So Hurts number two. At number three, I got Mahomes. Not quite as much rushing upside as those first two guys, but this year the deep ball should be back a little bit with Xavier Worthy and Hollywood Brown. He should be able to pick up more chunk plays and get back to some of the yardage totals maybe that we're used to seeing and cut down on the turnovers when he tries to go deep and be back in the MVP consideration. Like Especially if Rasheed Rice doesn't get suspended, they're going to have field stretchers and they're going to be able to work over the middle so well with Rice and Kelsey. So he's up for a big season. Again, rushing touchdowns are big in fantasy. Mahomes doesn't figure to get as many of those. Still think it's worthy of a number three spot. At number four, I've got Lamar. Doesn't quite put up the, the lofty passing yardage totals of the three guys above him. And he's cooled down a little bit in terms of being a volume rusher. But he still gets a lot of rushing yards. <laughs> like he, he still led the league in yards per attempt last year. He's still about as dangerous as it gets on the ground. Hopefully this year, Mark Andrews can be healthier for a full season. Him combined with Isaiah likely combined with your Tuesday flowers. Like he's, he's, he's still going to be fine. So Lamar number four. Then we get into a stretch of quarterbacks that I really love. And I think you can kind of think of these guys almost on the same level as the first four because they're so set up to put up big passing numbers. But Dak Prescott, he was QB three last year. I think he's coming back for more at number five. CJ Stroud, number six. I'm a little bit nervous about Slowick. I am a little bit nervous about Slowick in this offensive line a little bit. It it wasn't as good as you'd think last year, considering Stroud's rookie of the year win and MVP hype and how good everything was. They were very run, run, pass heavy. And a lot of their success came down to Stroud bailing them out on third down. And this year, it seems like they should really open it up and have the highest pass rate in the league and... Stroud leads the league in touchdowns and yards and all that. And I think it could all happen because it's what should happen considering how they're built. But I'm a little, I I don't know if Slowick will unhitch the wagon fully, but the weapons are still, still so good. And Stroud is still so good that I got him at six. At number seven, I got Jordan Love. I think he's, he's in for a big season. Maybe not quite as big as Stroud because I think Stroud is, Probably the slightly better player with better weapons. But Love was on such a tear at the end of last year. I already detailed how impressed I was in the last episode where I predicted the Packers would win the NFC. And Love just has so many weapons. Like I talked earlier about, like, we don't really know who's going to sort out in this Packers receiving room in terms of fantasy. But if the problem is there's too many weapons, maybe just draft the quarterback. Maybe just draft the quarterback. If you can't decide, like, oh, is is Kraft good ADP? Is is Dobbs good ADP? Is Watson good ADP? Is and you're going through this list of of guys that you kind of like, 
and you can't decide, maybe just say, I'm going to reach on love. And that's kind of where I'm at. Like love is maybe a little bit higher for me than he is for other people at seven. At eight, I've got Joe Burrow. I got Joe Burrow. Should be back and as good as ever, I would say, with T. Higgins back in the fold, Jamar Chase healthy. He's also holding out. Damn, there's there's so many holdouts. I, I hope these don't go into the regular season and mess all my stuff up. But I, I, I've i become a bit of a Burrow defender, and I do think that he's become a little bit underrated in the public's eye. Like, it's become a common Twitter narrative I've seen about his playoff overratedness. Like, he has, doesn't have many signature performances there. Like... It, it does feel to me like people have kind of forgotten just how good he was. And he he proved me wrong so badly in 2021 when I thought the Bengals would be bad that he, I feel like I kind of got him res- to respect him from here on out. And even after they went to the Super Bowl, I was kind of like, oh, well, they regress. Like they didn't, they weren't the strongest team to go to the Super Bowl. Super Bowl losers a lot of the times don't bounce back. Like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then he just has an even better season than the one he did before, like super productive not an MVP winner, but a candidate. And I think a healthy Burrow is just so pinpoint. He can move in the pocket and make big time plays. Like he's got the weapons. He's, he's reads the field like a modern Tom Brady, I'd say. Like he's probably the closest guy to that in the league that we've got. I've seen a little bit of news out of Bengals camp that the Bengals are switching up their scheme a little bit. Uh, ben Solak reported that he's seen more kind of under center mcveigh e type schemes that Joe Burrow has traditionally not wanted to run and just has not run. And the, if there's any kind of growing pain there, then maybe the Bengals could fall short of my lofty expectations for them. But like, I think Burrow is good enough to kind of figure anything out if he has to. Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't, that's something to keep an eye on, I'd say. Boyd being gone, changes scheme. Maybe there's some hiccups coming back from the injury, but I I still think Burrow's going to put up numbers. At number nine, I've got Anthony Richardson. I'm a huge Anthony Richardson fan. Massive. Have been since his days at Florida. Thought he looked good with the Colts last season. Obviously made a huge impact in the fantasy box scores. And I knew all about it because he's my dynasty quarterback. So if he's healthy and he's giving you all that rushing production and all those touchdowns, he'll live up to his QB six billing and then some, but I cannot completely ignore the injury history. And I don't quite know if that rate of rushing success will quite sustain. I do think six is a bit optimistic, but at nine below like love and burrow and Stroud and stuff, Maybe it's silly. Maybe I should bet on rushing touchdowns over everything. But even though I love Richardson, I'm not. I'm not ready to take him over Burrow for my fantasy team, and then just him. Him unfortunately getting hurt or something like that again, or not having quite the passing yardage that Burrow has at all. But still, tons of upside there. So he's at number nine, and then number ten, I got Brock Purdy. I got Brock Purdy. I still think that he's going to be formidable in fantasy. He was one of my faves last year when he was really getting underdrafted. I thought can, and I was right, right. Betting on a Shanahan guy to, to overperform. And he did like, look at all the talent around him. And even if Ayuk goes, I still think Purdy has developed into a quarterback that is good enough to put up numbers with Kittle and Debo and Christian McCaffrey. And, you know, I've been shitting on Ricky Pearsall, but yeah, he's still a first round pick and Jawan Jennings is good as well. So like, no matter what happens, I think Purdy can throw, throw for some yards, throw for some touchdowns. And it would be a bit of a fall off from last year to finish his QB 10. And I think he is going to fall off maybe a little bit from the crazy numbers he was putting up, but the situation is so good for him still that I, I have him in my top 10. A sleeper. I like Geno Smith. I think that I could sing his praises all day. He's still a very legitimate franchise quarterback with great weapons. Pretty self-explanatory. He's someone pairing up with Ryan Grubb, who engineered the most prolific passing offense in college football last year. 
if he decides that he wants to come out and throw the ball at a really high rate next season, I actually think they could have a lot of success with that, throwing downfield, and Geno could rack up yardage totals that people aren't expecting and touchdown totals that people aren't expecting. Of course, it comes down to the offensive line right in Seattle. But I still believe in a couple of the players there, and I think the continuity can only get better. So I do think Geno Smith is in line for a bounce back season and and could very well be fantasy relevant. And that brings us, oh, I, I didn't say an over overrated player. Um, how about I give you Jaden Daniels? Jaden Daniels, because I did not love him coming out of the draft at all. And I think in Washington with Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury, you know, you can play somewhere in, in fantasy with how good you are. And he is a great runner and running matters. But I think you also need people to take you there. So it's not just in a vacuum, how good are you at a specific skill or how good are you as a player? It's, it's the whole offensive ecosystem. And when I look at Washington and I look what they built and I look at how many sacks they took last year and how they address the offensive line and what Jaden Daniels' struggles are as a player, I'm a little bit concerned it looks more like Sam Howell than maybe Jalen Hurts next season. And even though he can run, I think Washington's offense will have too many rough moments and there will be too many games where Jaden Daniels just looks like a rookie and you've got th- three points from your quarterback this week. Like, I, I don't think Jaden Daniels is above those types of games. Now, I think against some defenses, he will run absolutely wild and put up 40. But with the quarterback position, I am really looking for consistency because one bad week can really fuck over your entire team for that week. And I don't think Jaden Daniels is going to be any kind of consistent performer in Washington year one. So I I would say he's a bit overranked. I think that he could really burn you if he's your starter all year and the guy you're relying on. The last position group I'm going to talk about, the tight ends. Guess who I have number one? Guess what team he plays for? It's George Kittle. I feel like I'm going insane when I see him ranked other places. He's like six or seven. Was he not number one last year? Like what happened? Did he fall off and and I'm not aware of it? Like, hold on. I got to check PPR. Okay. He was fifth. He does block a lot. I'll say that. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'm silly. Maybe I'm silly for the Kittle number one ranking. Maybe I bit off more than I can chew looking at the efficiency numbers. I don't care, man. Anybody can fall off. Kittle's always going to be there for me. Trust in the Shanahan system. And number two, I got Laporta. Greatest rookie season ever for a tight end, potentially. Still going to be a huge part of that offense alongside Amon Ross St. Brown as they wait for a third presence to make itself known. Three, I've got Travis Kelsey. Him and Mahomes, like he's coming off a down year in the regular season, a down fantasy year, but then he really turned it on in the playoffs, which gives me a little bit of hope that he can continue to at least keep up his pace from 2020. Uh, three and not like fall off to an insane degree or anything like that. Cause the number one killer is age. And that really is a concern with Kelsey, but he averaged 14.6 points per game last season. I'm seeing that was first in the league. So he can only fall so far and he's just money and fantasy every single year. So I got Kelsey number three, four. I got Mark Andrews five. Oh God. It makes me cringe to even hear myself say this. My number five tight end is Kyle Pitts. It's Kyle Pitts season. I believe it. I truly do. I antagonized over Pitts or Trey McBride. The reason I went with Pitts is because Pitts is a real route runner downfield. Like 
in a way that McBride is not. And Pitts had a real bounce back year last year, I felt, from where he was at in 2022. As a rookie, he had 1,000 yards right. Everybody was happy. Second year, complete collapse. Third year, definitely not to the level that people want, not to the level that he was at his rookie season or the level of prospects he was billed at, but a huge rebound from where he was in 2022. Explosive play rate through the roof amongst other tight ends for Kyle Pitts. Like I said, real route runner downfield, real vertical threat in a way no other tight end is. And he was actually extremely efficient on pure dropback progressions last year. Like when, when Ritter was just going three steps and reading things out or five steps and reading things out, like Pitts was a great part of the offense. The thing is, that just wasn't a huge part of the Falcons passing offense at all. And too often he was used as a decoy or just as a blocker for the highest run rate in the league. This year with Kirk Cousins, I do think that they will flesh out that five-step drop back attack more and Pitts is going to be super valuable in that. So I think that this is actually like last year we got back on track. This year we're getting fully back on track with Kyle Pitts. Six, I got Dalton Kincaid. His, he's playing with Josh Allen. So a good selection, I think. But I don't know, just Pitts, Pitts is such a special player to me. Like he's still so unique at his size, the way he's able to catch the football. Some of the yak plays I've seen him make over the course of his career. Maybe I, I'm weighing too much on what I thought of him as a prospect, but like Kincaid is in a better situation than Pitts is, but I still think there's like a very unique star player that Pitts could develop into that I think like guys like Kincaid and McBride and Ferguson, my next guys kind of can't, but we'll see. Maybe that's silly. At number seven, I got Trey McBride. He's a bit overranked to me. Like he's above Kelsey in a lot of rankings. Like he's two or three in a lot of rankings. I think McBride is very talented. Making contested catches, he's a beast. After the catch, like absolute dog. But so many of his catches last year were kind of auxiliary targets. I felt like, like screens. And he did, he made the most of those or like check down, like they'd run like four verticals on third and long and they'd throw it to him underneath and he would pick up a ton of yards, which he's a great player. Like he was good at doing that. But I think with Marvin Harrison in the fold this year, McBride's emphasis underneath will kind of get turned down a little bit as they go back more towards the boundary I think Harrison's arrival will allow Dorch to thrive a little bit more and Michael Wilson to thrive a little bit more. And I think the offense is going to center a little bit less on McBride than it did last year when he was far and away their best weapon. And that's why I think even though he might make some strides as a player and he's still a great player, I'm not as bullish on the full breakout as most people are. But... Still a very useful player for the Cardinals. I just don't know if it'll quite shake out where he's a top three tight end like Kelsey is next year. At number eight, I got uh, Ferguson, Dallas's tight end. Unsexy pick, but I absolutely love this pick. Absolutely love Ferguson um, if you can get him late. He had 25 receptions in, or 25 targets inside the 25-yard line last year, I think. And he only had five touchdowns, but he was their red zone guy. And I think at any moment, that touchdown number could change from five to 10 to 12. They don't, they don't count playoff stats. So he had five touchdowns, but like, for example, he had three in the game against the Packers. And I think if you take him, he kind of is the second option there after CD. So I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised at the workload that he gets week in and week out. Like, yes, he's very unspectacular. He's just this white guy out of Wisconsin. He doesn't have the craziest highlights. Okay, it's Jake Ferguson. You feel like you're just okay at that position. But really what you're getting is someone Dak looks at a lot and looks at more than any other tight end in the red zone. More than any other tight end in the red zone. So the touchdowns could come often with with Ferguson. I think you could be sitting there enjoying like big weeks every week that you didn't quite expect if, if you take Ferguson. Absolutely love that pick. 
At number nine, I've got Evan Ingram. At number 10, I've got David Njoku, kind of similar players. Ninjoku was on a tear, an absolute tear at the end of last season. But I don't know if he'll quite continue it just because he was so bad with Watson in. in. <laughs> like, he has never done anything with Watson. But with Flacco and he was absolutely lighting it up because they were just throwing him so many screens. And he really did things with those screens. Like, he was great with the ball in his hands. But I could see that offense not being as ideal for him specifically as they add Jerry Judy as potentially Nick Chubb comes back in the back half of the season and they don't need to throw the ball quickly out to him as much. Like he's still a vertical threat. He's still a top 10 tight end in Joku, but I don't know if the tear he was on at the end of the year will quite sustain. I I would rather have Ferguson and McBride and Kincaid and Ingram. Like I said, similar player, similar skill set. Slightly better quarterback, so I prefer him. Some sleepers. I like Taysom Hill. (laughs) I like Taysom Hill, man. He is just kind of always around for a few big fantasy weeks every year. He'll sneak it in for a touchdown a couple times a season. He will not get drafted by anybody because he's like, not playing tight end some games and other games he's got more heavily involved and you don't want to deal with like zero point weeks, which you probably would sometimes with Taysom Hill, but he still has like enough good weeks to justify taking him a little bit higher than he is selected in these drafts. I think like he has been a top 10 tight end in terms of scoring and it might be bullshit. Like he came in and passed a touchdown or something, but like that's probably going to still continue to kind of happen. I I still think like the Saints will have a weird obsession with him. And then another deep sleeper, I got Hunter Henry. So, so boring of a pick. But he's like tight end 23 right now on sleeper. And in most leagues, you'll never have to care about this. But if you do, I just don't think, like he's never been below tight end 23. And if it didn't happen last year, it's not going to happen this year. He's actually been like a solid tight end before in the past when the offensive situation is competent. Like he was a tight end nine, for example, when Mac Jones was a rookie. And now I think things have stabilized enough in New England. I hope things have stabilized enough that he can kind of go back to just being out there and getting the, you know, the boring yards because he's going to be out there. They just signed him to a three-year extension. They committed to him. They got rid of Mike Kosicki and he's low-key the most veteran presence that the Pats have in the receiving core. So I could see like kind of a weird amount of targets flowing through him and him being like definitely more than the 23rd most important tight end to their offense, even though he's not very much a high upside player. So if you really want to wait for tight end and just fill the hole with someone competent in like a deep league, I think you can kind of wait and wait and wait and get Hunter Henry and be okay and make up the difference between him and the other tight ends. If you like spent an extra pick on like a sexy running back or something like that, that has high upside. Who's overrated here? Probably Friar I do not want to draft any more tight ends in an Arthur Smith offense after what I've been through these last few years. And that's all I got. No kickers, no defenses today. We've gone on an hour 10. It's very late at night for me. (laughs) Sorry for my misspeaks. I'm a little tired, but thank you all so much for listening. I hope this advice helps you win your league. I hope you all build my all Shanahan tree team. That's my plan. You're welcome all to, to follow it and be sure to like, and subscribe everywhere you get your podcasts. Check out the other pro football network content. Check out their mock draft simulator, check out their fantasy football team name generator. If you have drafted this brilliant team and you're still uh, Theo's terrific team on Yahoo, you know, check out the fantasy football team name generator. And yeah, man, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. I'll see you guys next time. 